there are a lot of, not a lot, but churches here and there, just individual pastors here and there, that are holding on to the truth and looking for Jesus to come, that are not swayed by the apostasy and deception. And a lot of these guys are coming to see the truth about the return of the Lord, that it's not pre-tribulational. Uh, there's a guy in uh, Australia whose notes I looked at. His name is Mike Smith. Don't know where he lives in Australia. Uh, he, he misses a lot of things, but he's basically seeing... He's, I, I mean, he didn't, there was nothing in his notes that I didn't already know, but he was still saying basically the right thing. He had a few points off, but he clearly, the Lord showed him that this pre-trib stuff is not right, that the Lord is coming between the sixth and seventh seal. There was a book by a Jewish guy met named Marvin Rosenthal, which I read, and again, Bob Van Kampen. Uh, I read their books, and they were surprised to find the Pentecostal, or charismatic, who had been saying for some time that the rapture is between the sixth and seventh seal, that we have to know who the Antichrist is before Jesus can come, and that we have to make a distinction between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God. And they just couldn't believe that somebody who wasn't a Baptist could figure this out, given the fact that most Baptists can't figure it out. <laughs> that was their thinking. Uh, I'm not the only one who's saying this stuff. Now, I would have to say that because I look at the Jewish background, I'm able to piece things together differently in the terms of like we did last night, looking at Joshua and things like looking at the Midrash. They're missing that. But they're still getting the essence of the fact of when the rapture is. And there's more and more people coming along to that way of thinking. Now, not a huge amount, but the numbers are growing. You know, I'm, I'm considering doing a tape called Reductio Ad Absurdum. They get around that verse the same way they get around Hebrews 6 about the great falling away, or about the falling away. It's impossible, you know, uh, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Uh, they come with the presupposition. It can't mean what it seems to say, therefore it must mean something different. <laughs> we don't want to believe. Yeah. They begin on a presu... Instead of letting the text speak for itself, they come with the presupposition. They come with the presupposition. See, I, I never came to the Bible with the presupposition. I didn't know if it was God's word. I believed it wasn't. I believed people wrote it. I didn't come with any... I, yeah, my presupposition was negative. You know, I didn't even come, I had a negative presupposition. I thought people wrote it, but I was open-minded about it. We all have presuppositions. We all have presuppositions. The task is to come to the Word of God and say, I have no presuppositions. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit show me. Okay. That's the task. Uh, and it's the thing the new creation can do because it's in tune with the Holy Spirit. But the natural mind, the natural man, the natural woman, we're still going to battle with presuppositions. We are still going to have certain prejudices and orientations in our thinking that can make it difficult to get beyond that. But when you have people who have been preaching a certain thing for 30, 40 years, <laughs> or more, and they went to a seminary or a Bible college where their professors taught them this, <laughs> and their professors taught it to them, you're going, to them it's almost, you're denying the fundamental truth almost. To them it's almost like making a heretical statement. I know people, particularly in the States, that if you question pre-tribulationism, they, to them it's borderline heresy. I've, even, I've met people in England that if you question it, it's, it's crazy. Now, it's, it, it's not borderline heresy, of course. And I'm not saying that their error is heretical. I'm just saying it's wrong. But fortunately, you've got the Marvin Rosenthal's, you've got the Mike Smiths in Australia, who I have to recognize, you, the late Van, Bob, Robert Van Kampen. Going back to Tregalius, even though the brethren, it was the brethren who popularized this myth of the pre-trib rapture, their best scholar, Tregelius, did not have that view. Samuel Tregelius, Dr. Tregelius, did not have that view. Um, remember, these things are sealed. As we get closer to the return of Jesus, and as things get more unsealed, faithful people are going to see clearer and clearer. In the last days, we have this issue. Understanding becomes a barometer of faithfulness. I've pointed this out a number of times. Understanding becomes the barometer of faithfulness. The old time Pentecostals always sang, give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. 
Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The wise virgins had the oil in their lamp. They were ready for the bridegroom to come. They had the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Everybody has a lamp, but what good is it with no oil in it? <laughs> okay. So too, Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church of Anna, people's opinions, people's self-interpreted rights, by sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. I pointed out a number of times, and we'll see this in Turkey in April, Laodicea's first problem is it doesn't know it's Laodicea. <laughs> They're blind to their own condition. And Daniel, none of the wicked will understand. Those who have insight will give understanding to the many. Daniel 11 and 12. In the last days, how much we understand the word of God will be an arch indicator of faithfulness. Those who understand will understand because the Holy Spirit is going to show them. Remember, if somebody has a huge intellect and a huge ego to go with it, it becomes difficult for the Holy Spirit to communicate to that person because their pride is in the way. You have a person who doesn't have a huge intellect but a right heart, it's easier for Jesus to show that person. They might not know all the academic theology and all the Greek and Hebrew, but they're going to see. This is important. I had a young Calvary Chapel pastor, a young black guy, last week before last, at a Bible study in London. <laughs> Not formally educated in the ministry. I don't know if he went to university, but he certainly didn't have much of a theological education, if he had any. But he was a good guy, just a nice guy, young Calvary Chapel pastor, young black guy. And he said, look, just reading the Bible, I'm getting a lot of flack in Calvary chapels because I believe in a plurality of elders. I don't believe in just having one pastor. And other Calvary guys said, how can you say that? How can you say that? And he said, because of the Bible. They were <laughs> now, I like Calvary chapels, generally speaking. I have a lot of friends who are Calvary pastors. But I must agree with this guy. The Bible teaches a plurality of elders where the senior pastor is simply the first among equals, the primus into Paris. But this young guy, this young pastor, he said to me, I cannot understand anything other than the rapture happening during the tribulation after we know who the Antichrist is. Now this is not a formally educated man, at least not in theology. But his heart was right. You know, a simple guy, he grew up in the inner city, got saved, I guess out of a background that was not the best, I guess, I don't know him that well. But he understood, he knew, he saw. The most important thing in understanding these things is our relationship with Jesus. If somebody has a right heart, the Holy Spirit will show them. Now the Bible does say, study to show yourself approved. People who have a right heart will want to know, will want to study. What's scaring me now a lot is something I saw in America a few weeks ago but this guy Brian McLaren, the Emergent Church. Him saying, he, they, well we'll sit in a circle and discuss it. It all becomes subjective. Maybe there are no ultimate answers. I don't know all the answers, maybe there aren't any. It's not about that. <laughs> They're saying the Bible does not have again propositional truth. Scripture is based on propositional truth. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again as objective facts. But these people would sit around, read a passage, this is what it means to me, this is what it means. You assign your own meaning to it. This is called conscientiousization. People caught up in this will never be ready for the return of Jesus. Those churches will collapse like houses of cards. It'll be again Elijah feeding the sons of prophets in groups of fifties, those churches will survive. The other thing that obviously scares me is Rick Warren. Don't study prophecy, it's a diversion. At a time when prophecy is being fulfilled, when we should be getting into it more, they're telling people don't do it. Now you look at this. This place should be filled up. Not because of Jacob Prash, but because Jesus is coming. 30 years ago, it would have been filled up. <laughs> you got a remnant who's going to be ready. 
My task is to get as many people into that remnant as I can by God's grace and get as many people prepared for his coming as I can. I can only do what God allows me to do. But the popular stuff is never going to equip the church. They will not equip the saints. There's not enough money in it, not enough numbers in it, not enough limelight in it for the way the church has become based on show business and marketing. It's just not happening. Remember, they were fed in smaller groups. Elijah fed them in smaller groups. Now, I'm not Elijah, and I'm not saying that you're the sons of the prophets. I'm simply saying it's the same principle. It's the same principle. Jezebel is going on the warpath. A number of years ago, nearly 10 years ago now, less than that, but nearly 10, there were people laughing and rolling on the floor and saying, revival is coming, prepare for victory, prepare, prepare for blessing. And I told people, prepare for persecution. We did a couple of conferences called Preparing for Persecution. And I was told by Elam and the Assemblies of God and people like this, their pastors, that I was blaspheming the Holy Spirit because I said that their laughing drunken thing was not a revival, it was carnal, some of it was demonic, and it wasn't going to bring a revival. So I blasphemed, I committed the unpardonable sin. Now obviously no revival came, and many of those leaders who were into this kind of stuff have been found in immorality, personal immorality since that time. Uh, again, now you have in Great Britain the British government trying to restrict freedom of speech for Christians. Harry Hammond was attacked by a group of homosexuals in, 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 in Sussex. A Christian policewoman, a man, didn't want to arrest him. A, a, a policewoman, allegedly a lesbian, did want to arrest him. He got arrested. The Crown Prosecutor spent 2,500 pounds to fly a witness from Australia against him because he insulted gay people by having a sign telling homosexuals they need to repent. Free speech is going. Free speech is going quickly. You have an American president who is a man with absolutely no scruples whatsoever, a man of no integrity, completely owned by oil interest, does not care about anything except that. Uh, he will allow the Saudis to finance the CAIR in America, even though the FBI says it's had links to terror. And he will still let them do it, because that's what the oil companies want. Don't offend the Saudis. This organization mounts well-financed campaigns with Saudi oil money to drive people off television and radio for insulting Islam, as they would see it. They got rid of Kilroy Silk, and I'm no fan, a fan of Kilroy Silk, but the Muslims got him kicked off the BBC. Now they're doing it in America. It's well-financed, and you've got politicians like Blair and Bush, select interests are in their pocket, and then they'll, they'll go turn against the church in a minute. Forget about freedom of speech. Democracy is disappearing. You're going into a non-democratic Europe. It's disappearing very quickly. Persecution is inevitable. But what will happen is what I warned would happen when we did the tapes preparing for persecution. The apostate church will be our first enemy. I was at a meeting with my daughter. She's a law student. She's a member of the Law Society. And it was only pastors and lawyers who were invited. I came to this meeting in London last week about stopping this anti-vilification law. Okay? And we had all kinds of people speak to us. All kinds. We had the, uh, the a very senior police detective saying, who was president of the Christian Fellowship of Policemen in London, he was a chief inspector or something like that, detective chief inspector, he said, look, persecution is coming, I'm telling you, I see this coming in the police, what's going to happen? In Australia, in Victoria, and in England, you had liberal bishops, Anglican bishops, supporting these anti-free speech laws. So you can't criticize Islam, or if you say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you've blasphemed Islam. You've got bishops supporting laws like that in, that Lords, in the House of Lords and in Australia. The enemy is always the traitor. Many will fall away and betray one another. Many. Okay. Islam is an obvious enemy. Mormonism is an obvious enemy. The Church of Rome is an obvious enemy, but they're not the biggest enemy. The biggest enemy is the cancer inside the body. The traitors who will compromise with such people, who will take their side against the evangelicals. These are the real enemies. This is what the book of Revelation tells us is going to happen. 
It's what Matthew 24 tells us what's going to happen. And it's what is happening. There is no possible way that people who are going into the emergent church and purpose-driven and alpha and the ecumenical and whatever it is, there is no possible way they will even begin to understand this book. They're being told not to read it. Well, Luther said don't read it, so we shouldn't. Now Rick Warren says don't get into that, so we should The book itself says it's the only book of the Bible with a blessing on those who read it. They're telling you not to. <laughs> well, who do you listen to, them or God? Well, unfortunately, most Christians are listening to them instead of God. Even though the text itself plainly says it's the only book with a blessing on reading it. They wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't have a clue. What we looked at yesterday, the difference between the ram's horn and the, 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 and the, and, and the silver horn, and the, that, that wouldn't even come into their thinking. They, they wouldn't even, it's something they wouldn't even notice. And it's frightening. It is frightening. The bridegroom will come. They will have no oil in their lamps. And they're not going anywhere. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Summer is ended, they will say. They will say, harvest is past. And then they will say, and we are not saved. Summer is ended, harvest is past, and they'll say, we are not saved. We are also told the time will come when the foolish virgins will scramble, crave to get the oil. They will go to the ones who have it and say, give us some of yours, sell us some of yours. <laughs> Notice, sell it. That's how the treasure becomes such a business and prices on everything. And the wise virgins will say, we can't, there's no time. You should have been getting this stuff 5, 10, 20 years ago. A time will come when they will fill this place out, hoping to get what you're getting now. Only you're not going to be here. <laughs> They're going to be craving what you're getting now, but it will be too late for them to get it. I, you hear what I said? I promise you. A time will come when these people will be craving in desperation to get the oil, but it will be too late for them to get it. The time to get it is now, and that's what we're here for to put oil into the lamps. Turn with me please to the book of Revelation once again. Chapter 6. We concluded last night looking at the time frame. The Colobo. The Colobo is the cutting short of the time. The Harpezo is the snatching away, the rapture. The Episunagage is the rapture plus the resurrection, our gathering around him. Okay. This is the Perusia, the revelation. Once this event happens between the sixth and seventh seals, as we will look at in a moment, this introduces the day of the Lord. The Bible says that we should hasten his coming. Hasten his coming. But it says, be not anxious for the day of the Lord. Come out by evangelism and discipleship. By evangelism and discipleship, when the full number of the Gentiles comes in. That is how we hasten his coming. We can actually make it happen faster. Now a time will come when no man can work. 
it will not be possible to evangelize in the way we do now. God turns his grace to the Jews, there's 144,000, but what we know is over. The shattering of the power of the holy people. Once we are extricated, once we are removed, it is the day of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Second Peter 3, 1 to 3. Knowing this first, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the foundation of the world. There is good reason to believe that the Antichrist will counterfeit the millennium. And for many people, things will seem to be somewhat normal. Look at it this way. You can put on the idiot box in America or Europe and watch con artist preachers from the States or South Africa telling you about blessing and victory. You can change the channel and put on the news and watch Christians being massacred in Sudan. They're living in a different world than the real one in which most Christians live in. In other words, more Christians have been killed in the last 50 years than in all of the history of the church. More people have been killed for the name of Christ in the last 50 years than in all re recorded Christians. Well, who cares about Christians? What's happening in the third world to Christians will eventually come to the developed world. But these other people won't care. I got my credit card. Here it is right here. It won't matter to them. They won't realize what's happening. Again, it's the silent killer. The church will have birth pangs. It will know what's happening. The other people won't know what's happening. Is a toothache a good thing? From my point of view and your point of view, no. From a dentist's point of view, yes. Not just because he gets paid, but because he knows that the decay is causing the pain. There's a nerve inside the tooth that is telling you and telling him this person has decay, they will lose the tooth, we need to drill it or do a root canal or we need to do something to save the tooth. The pain is a bad thing, but the pain is a good thing. It is a necessary evil. The dentist sees the pain differently than we do. Is the fever a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the fever is a bad thing, yet a fever is a good thing. Because a fever tells you you have some kind of viral infection or something of this nature. You need to do something about it. It's a bad thing, but it is a good thing. At least you know something is going on. But what happens if someone develops, God forbid, a carcinoma or a silent killer? I feel pretty good. Never felt better. <laughs> but there's no symptoms telling them that they're in trouble. By the time the symptoms show up, it is too late to save their neck. <laughs> Thank God for fevers. Thank God for toothaches. Because there's a solution to the problem. At least we know we have a problem. That is what Peter's telling us. Once again, 2 Peter 3, 1 to 3. If millions of people suddenly disappeared in the rapture, bringing chaos to the planet like these people are telling us, <laughs> and then think things could go on, it would be crazy. That's not what it's going to be. Forget about the Tim LaHaye fairy tales. The day of the Lord, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 10 to 14, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat. The works also that are therein will be burned up with fire. 
Beloved brethren, seeing that you look for these things, be diligent to be found without spot and blameless. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 14. The elements will be dissolved with fire. The word there is stoichie. Stoichie. As in stoichiometry in chemistry. Stoichie. I explained before that before the 20th century, before Einstein's theory of relativity, nobody knew you could dissolve a stoichie, an element. They didn't know about enriched plutonium, they didn't know about uranium-238, they didn't know you could split a stoichie. A stoichie is an element. By atomic number, it's, the, it's, it's elemental. You can't get anything smaller than that without dissolving the element. But the element itself couldn't be dissolved. That was atmost to the Greeks, that which was indivisible. Yet somehow a fisherman from Galilee not only said you can dissolve an element with intense heat, but you can dissolve an, an element with such intense heat that the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. You can destroy the planet by dissolving elements. That's exactly what it says in the Greek language. It's like this. When I was a little boy, when Khrushchev came to the United Nations in New York and took his shoe off and began pounding on the podium, we will bury you, we will bury you. Within months, the Politburo got rid of him. You can't have a nut with his finger on the button. The Soviets wouldn't let a maniac like that have his finger on the button. He'll get us all blown to kingdom come. During the Watergate crisis, trying to save his neck politically, Nixon was drunk and stoned on tranquilizers. Kissinger and Haig were trying to keep him under control. He calls a stage three nuclear alert on the Soviets in October of 1973. We can't have a drunken madman with his finger on the button. He's gone. Overnight, his own party turns against him. The Islamic mind does not think this way. One suitcase bomb in Tokyo, one suitcase bomb in Hong Kong, one suitcase bomb in New York, one suitcase bomb in London, one Paris, one Washington, one in Sydney. There goes the economy of the world. They will push the button. They don't think rationally. It's an irrational religion. They think jihad. A Hindu is the same. I will be reincarnated and come back as a Brahmin. The world is in a much more precarious state now than it was during the Cold War because you now have Hindus and Muslims, Pakistan and India with nuclear weapons and if these fall into the hands of fundamentalists, people will do anything. If one nuclear weapon went off anywhere, people would freak out. Would they give up their freedom? Yes, already. Rather than deport Muslims and close Islamic institutions and protect the borders, the American government will tell people to show up three hours early at an airport and take your sneakers off, put on your computer, just so as not to offend the people who want to kill you because of money and politics and corruption in the White House. That's it. That's just the way it is. People will give up their freedom to try to prevent this from happening. But ultimately, it becomes inevitable. The only thing going to stop us from wiping ourselves out is the return of Jesus. If he did not come back, no flesh would be saved. Let me explain. What happens in the sealed judgments <coughs> is demonic, it's in the divine plan, but it's largely the repercussions of things man has done to himself. Once we are taken out of here, now it's the day of the Lord. It's not the devil doing it. It's not people doing it. Not fallen man doing it. It's God doing it. In vengeance, in anger, and in retaliation. This is the day of the Lord. Let's read now from the book of Revelation, chapter 6. He weeps because no man can open it. 
But in chapter 5, verse 5, as we saw last night, they found one who was worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. How does he open the seals? The seals are opened, or the way they're opened, is what we read in Matthew 24. The Olivet Discourse. Basically, Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21, Mark 13. The Olivet Discourse. And the Apocalypse. Something is happening. People don't realize how they're being set up in the media-driven age. Okay. On the days of Noah tapes, we talk about the Nephilim, demonic beings coming down from the sky. We relate this to what happened in the days of Jared, and we show things about um, extraterrestrial research. I have no doubt in my mind there's a demonic nature to these things. There's no proof of extraterrestrial life with exobiology, but the declassified reports by the American government and the Blue Report and so forth do show that it's parapsychic phenomena. The cult. To me, it is just a silly Hollywood movie by Steven Spielberg or a pop record by David Bowie. But things like Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars and things like E.T. and Close Encounters Going back to Superman, this is setting people up. They'll look for a Messiah, a Savior coming from the sky. It has to counterfeit Jesus. Okay. Let's go beyond that. Why does the church have to look to Hollywood to evangelize? A biblically and historically inaccurate movie like The Passion of the Messiah, they're calling it the greatest evangelistic tool ever. Even though the person who made it, Mel Gibson, said on TV in America, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to go to heaven. Even though when he was asked in Australia by the Australian newspaper, what impact did making this film have on your life? He said, I don't have to answer questions like this anymore. I have a hell of a lot more money than I used to. He made it for money. He doesn't believe the gospel. Yet this is Franklin Graham's greatest evangelistic tool ever. Filled with biblical and historical inaccuracy, it is the Roman Catholic Stations of the Cross comes to the silver screen but you know what? There are people going to see movies like The Omen and Arnold Schwarzenegger's End of Days. They're getting their theology from Hollywood. <laughs> what a place to get theology. They're getting their eschatology from the silver screen. Not only are they getting their soteriology from it, they're getting their eschatology from it. They're looking at the wrong stuff. They're going to the movies instead of going to the Word of God. The whole thing is a big setup. Even unsaved people know something's happening, don't they? Even unsaved people know something's happening, don't they? When you sit them down and talk to them, they know something's happening. But they have this idea somehow, I can't deal with that so things can be the way they used to be. We're just going to pretend things are going to go on as normal even though underneath they know it isn't. Jesus warned about this. They wouldn't know until the people got on the ark it was too late. We, of course, are trying to get on the ark and see how many we can take with us. And so, here in this chapter, we have the opening of the seals in chapter 6 and chapters 8. In chapter 7, no seals are opened. Now there are no chapter divisions in the original text, but there's a reason they put the divisions where they did. Good reason. It's a big space. This space of chapter 7 is what Bible scholars call the interlude. The interlude. Six things happen, but then the seventh doesn't happen yet. There's an interlude. What does it say in the book of Job? In six calamities he will preserve us, but from the seventh he will keep us? 
And I saw the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. There are those who mistakenly think this is the Lord Jesus. It is not. It is a counterfeit of the Lord Jesus. Turn to Matthew 24, 5, please. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and will mislead many. Part of the problem is, there will be so many false Christs, and false prophets, that when these two individuals show up, nobody will think they're anything more initially than just two more false ones. But it's more sinister than that. Early on, they're going to look like good guys, even to Christians. We talk about this on the Antichrist tape. So we have the four horsemen, the white horse, the man of sin. He makes a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. Let's talk about this a bit more. Jesus had his harbinger. The harbinger of Jesus was John the Baptist in the spirit character of Elijah. John the Baptist came from a religious background. He was the son of a high priest. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Because Christ had a harbinger, the Antichrist will have a harbinger. We call the false prophet. Now let's be really careful here. It's more complicated and more interesting than that. The book of Revelation does not call him Antichrist. We have many Antichrists. We have a spirit of Antichrist which is closely associated with the mystery of lawlessness. And we have these two beasts, ultimately, in Revelation, but they're all Antichrist. Antichrist meaning not only against Christ, but in place of. I'll say it again. It's a spirit that's always been in the world, closely associated with what the Bible calls the mystery of lawlessness. Secondly, there are many. Thirdly, it's these two ultimate guys. The way we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a triune God, you have again the satanic counterfeit. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The false prophet is to the Antichrist, although he is Antichrist, what the Holy Spirit is to Jesus. The false prophet is to Antichrist what the Holy Spirit is to Jesus. Okay. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He became the vehicle to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit according to John's Gospel, John 14 and John 17, that is the biblical vicar of Christ. The one who acts vicariously in place of Christ is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are both God, the false prophet and the beast are both Antichrist. When we interpret the Bible, one is your teacher who's in heaven. Mordiel, God is my teacher, God is your teacher. It is the Holy Spirit. When you have a religious figure 
saying he interprets the Bible and tells you what it means instead of the Holy Spirit, you got a problem. I can, by the grace of God, expound the scriptures. But when I do it, I'm telling you, be a Berean. Question, check this out, examine it. If someone says, my word is final authority, and if you don't agree with it, you're a heretic, you're an apostate, that is Antichrist. That is the Church of Rome, among others. That is the Mormons. Who are you to question us? We have the illumination. We have the Nassos. It's all based on Gnosticism. Every pope says he's the vicar of Christ, vicarius Christus. No, the Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ. This is what the false prophet is. You will see different people typifying him. Remember the dimensions of Goliath's armor. What did you have? The weight. Six, six, six. Who went before Goliath? His armor bearer. So often when you see a picture of the Antichrist, you see somebody going before him. It's always there. What's he there for? He has to have a harbinger. He has to have a harbinger. Prepare ye the way for the Antichrist. We'll be talking about the Antichrist more later. Seal one. White horse. Let's go back now to Revelation. Seal two. The red horse. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. We read Matthew 24, 5 and 6. Let's read Matthew 24, 7. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Somehow, although wars and rumors of wars are already increasing, the one on the white horse breaks this covenant. And then, literally, hell not only breaks loose, it literally breaks loose. It comes to earth. A war in the heavenlies comes to the planet. Something is really going to happen. There'll be so many wars, but ultimately they all become focused on the Middle East. Look now. There are three times as many conflicts involving Islam as there are all the other religio people groups put together. If there was no such thing as Israel, you'd still have 65,000 murdered Christians in the Philippines. If there was no such thing as Israel, you'd still have 300,000 murdered Christians in East Timor. If there was no such thing as Israel, we'd still have 2.3 million murdered Christians in Sudan and Mr. Bush's religion of peace and tolerance. The Philippines is thousands of miles from Israel. If you've got Abu Sayyaf. Indonesia is thousands of miles from Israel. Al Ismailia. And they're all saying the same thing. It's because of Israel. It's because of <laughs> it's the Zionists. It's, the <laughs> it's not about the Jews, it's about the God of the Jews. Somehow <clears throat> we're supposed to believe that all the world's problems are caused by this little nation politically. No, the world's problems are not caused by this little nation politically. The world's problems are caused by the Satan who was trying to destroy 
this nation to prevent the return of Christ because Christ is going to destroy him. He knows his time is short. There were some statements last week that were too vulgar to say before Christians. It was literal vulgarity. Statements made against Israel by the French ambassador in London last week. It was open vulgarity. Because of that such and such nation, all the world's problems are being caused by that such and such very vulgar adjective nation, Israel. Little nation Israel. And he was just vulgar about it. He refused to apologize. You got France, Europe saying this. Do you really believe that if Israel didn't exist, could anybody really believe if there was no Israel that the Muslims would stop persecuting Christians in Sudan? <laughs> it's absurd. Third seal. The black horse. Verse 5. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Well, that's interesting. No grain, no meat, but you got luxury items. <laughs> now, the oil and wine, obviously, it's typological of things spiritual. They don't want to give the Holy Spirit and worship the Holy Spirit and so forth. It has typological meanings. In other words, the only things that will not be touched by this black horseman is something at, that at this point only the true believers have. The Holy Spirit is no longer convicting the world of sin. The Holy Spirit is no longer uniting and empowering the church. It is something that is in the hearts of God's people. Only everything else he can touch. Satan can touch flesh, he can touch the world, he can touch the church, he can touch everything except the new creation. That's the one thing he cannot touch. And this frustrates him. I have several times told the story of a believer I knew in Israel from Russia. He was an elder in an underground church under the communists. This is going back some years. Had five children, Jewish guy. Before the Iron Curtain came down, the communists arrested him. His family at one point didn't know if he was dead or alive. They put him in a gulag. They beat him. They tortured him. They gave him psychotropic drugs to try to destroy his faith. And I remember he came finally to Israel as a Jew. And of course, there were those who didn't want to let him in, namely the Orthodox. But his wife would take him, literally hold his hand like a little boy, and the little kids would follow. And all he could say was, Slava Bogo, Slava Bogo, Slava Bogo, praise the Lord, Slava Bogo. That's all he could say. They destroyed his health, they destroyed his life in this world, they destroyed for all intent purposes his marriage and family life, they certainly destroyed his mind. But the one thing they could not destroy was what they wanted to destroy most, his faith in Jesus. That is the one thing Satan cannot touch. But the rest, he can have it. He's going to get it. For two times a time and a half time, he will call the shots. Okay. So, we have this horse. Look again at Matthew 24, 7. This black horse on the third seal. Jesus' interpretation was, there shall be famines in various places. Matthew 24, 7. Matthew 24, 7. 
fourth seal. Verse 7 of Revelation chapter 6, When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come! And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death and Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with famine, with pestilence, and with wild beasts of the earth. This ashen or sometimes translated pale horse. Death and sickness being the result of pestilence and disaster. Again, Matthew 24, 7. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Let's talk about nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In Greek, different words. Nation, kingdom. In Hebrew, nation, goy, kingdom, malchut, Greek, nation, ethnon. Kingdom, Basilea, these wars will be rooted in racial conflict. By racial conflict, I don't simply mean Asian against Westerner, or black against white, or yellow against, you know, not that. In Yugoslavia, you had white against white. In Rwanda, Burundi, you have black against black. In the war between Iran and Iraq, you had Muslim against Muslim. In the war between Vietnam and Cambodia, you had not only communist against communist, you had Cambodian Asian yellow against Vietnamese Asian yellow. There will be a mad quest for the brotherhood of man based on monoculturalism and a unified religion, but it will never ever work. The only way people can be one across national lines in the ethnic sense is by one in Christ. For us it does not matter what you were born, it only matters if you were born again. Our unity is not based on biological birth and the ethnic identity that comes with it. Our unity is not based on biological birth, our unity is based on new birth. But for the others, it will never work. they will never ever stop the ethnic tensions. And I'm not just talking about skin color or religion. Anything will do. This ethnic conflict comes to political conflict. The only way the political conflict fights between nations politically will stop is when the ethnic wars stop. As Isaiah says, when the Messiah returns and sets up his kingdom, lo isa goy lo goy herev, nation will not lift its sword against nation. Yes, in the millennial reign of Jesus, they will beat their swords into pruning hooks. In the meantime, you want a good investment? Buy shares 
and a defense contractor. <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. I'm simply saying I can guarantee while there may be shortages of food, there will not be shortages of weapons. A number of years ago, I watched something in Somalia. <clears throat> I was in England and I watched it on a documentary. It was a market. There was no food. No food. You could not buy any food. There were children with swollen guts getting ready to die. You could not buy any food, but you could buy an RPG for five dollars. And you could buy an RPG a rocket propelled grenade with a launcher for ten dollars. You couldn't buy an egg, but you could buy a deadly weapon. Plenty of those. You look at Angola. No food. Plenty of Kalashnikov rifles, but no food. Now what does a starving person who has nothing but a Kalashnikov rifle do to get food? <laughs> it's obvious what a starving person who's not a believer and who has no food, but he does have a Kalashnikov rifle is going to do to get the food. You understand? Part of our problem is we don't live in the third world. We're living in countries whose models of economy, government, and culture were still framed by biblical influences. Now that those biblical influences are being abandoned, the security and prosperity and stability that they have afforded us are disappearing. Now you have terrorist attacks in London, people afraid to go out, people afraid in New York City, it is getting like that. Just yesterday there was a court case in America where some guy went to court and he fought having to say the Pledge of Allegiance under God. And he won. You understand what's happening here? The only thing that could stop this is if people turn to God and you can delay it. People have always asked me, do you think a revival can come and we can prevent this? Mark my words, I've been saying this since the 1980s. I was sure. I don't say I get prophecies every day or these great revelations every day, but when the Lord gives me a revelation, it's never been wrong. It just doesn't happen every day. I'm absolutely convinced the Lord showed me that if re when revivals come to places in the developed world, it will be like King Josiah's. In the days of Josiah, because of the sin that happened under Manasseh, how do you say in English, Manasseh? Manasseh. Manasseh. That they killed so many babies. The judgment of God was inevitable. All they could do was delay it. God said it won't happen in your lifetime because you were faithful, but it's, the axe has to fall. It is inevitable that the wrath of God will fall on the Western world. It will fall on the developed world. Europe, Britain, America, Australia, Japan will not be immune. Judgment must fall. Even if revival happens, I'm telling you, I'm absolutely convinced. And I have been since the 80s. I believe the Lord revealed it to me through his word that the most revival can do is delay the inevitable and that's if there is a revival. So far we're not heading for revival, we're heading away from it. Nobody, nobody looking at the British Parliament where it says Paternoster Quius in Chalius in Westminster can deny the biblical foundations of parliamentary democracy. The Puritans were hyper-Calvinist. They got a lot wrong and made a lot of mistakes, but they understood something. The only way democracy can work is if we are governed by people who are governed by God. Instead, we have the deification of man. Democracy has become, we are governed by people who are governed by people the voice of the people. 
We're putting out a new tape called Demos, addressing this issue from Scripture, what the Bible says about democracy. It's one of the tapes, it's a message I'm doing next year at our conference in England in September when we have Bill Koenig from the White House, uh, White House Press Corps, and David Hawking, Dr. David Hawking from America. And next September we have a conference in England, and we're bringing these guys in from the States, and I will be addressing this issue, demos, what the Bible says about it. The Greek word occurs four times in the New Testament. Nobody, likewise in America, looking at the U.S. Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It says it, it, in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator. The establishment of the United States and its government is predicated on monotheistic belief. The only thing separation of church and state meant in America was that the Americans did not believe in Erastianism. They did not want a, ch a state church like in England. They didn't want a Church of England or a Lutheran church like in Europe or a Presbyterian church like in Scotland or a Dutch Reformed church like in South Africa. They, wanted a, they did not want an institutional church that was an agency of the state that all these churches could be treated individually. That matter of personal choice. It was not, the state was not to dictate which church is the official one. That's all it meant. But now you've got people legislating from the bench, judges saying, no, you can't mention God. That's <laughs> now nobody reading the Constitution would say that. What is this? This is man turning against God as never before. We are the epitome of clowns to imagine that people in Britain and America are not going to wind up like the people in Sudan. The only reason we are not already living under the conditions of the people in Sudan is because of the foundations of our society and government influenced by the Bible. Now you take Jesus Christ out of it, this is what's going to happen. What you already see happening in the third world, the two-thirds world, that will come to the developed world, to the Christians first. The saved Christians will get it first. And anti-Semitism will increase. Always be the Christians and Jews. That is how it's going to happen. Remember, these things, pestilence, famines, wars, are already happening. Black Africa is being depopulated. The HIV infection is so widespread, it's being depopulated. Malaria is killing so many more people, the only reason it doesn't get the recognition it deserves is because AIDS is killing more. This stuff will eventually come globally. It's already begun there. Now let's look again at Revelation. Notice it says, and the wild beasts of the earth. With this pale horse. In New Jersey, in the United States, New Jersey, you've got a bit of the country in the northern part of the state. And you've got resorts down the shore, the beach, the southern part of the state. But most of the state of New Jersey, it's one of the American states, the upper half of the state is a suburb of New York City, and the southern half of the state is a suburb of Philadelphia. <laughs> it's just a suburb of two places bigger than itself. <laughs> That's New Jersey. It doesn't have much of a character or identity of its own. But it's, an, it's by and large an affluent place. It's where Princeton University is. This place, New Jersey, last year, now this is suburbs now, 85 encounters with man-eating bears. That never used to happen. That used to happen in Colorado, once in a while. Now in the suburbs of New York City, you, 
And they don't know why, except that we're destroying the natural habitat of the bears, so they're invading human space. There are more deer now in the United States than there were when the pilgrims landed on the Mayflower. Because of the greenies, nobody wants to shoot Bambi, so instead they have Lyme disease. In England, everybody knows foxes, urban foxes, may as well be rats. But you can't hunt foxes anymore. I would say tally-ho. Those guys come into my garden, and I'm tired of going out there. Don't ask me how they get into the containers, but they do, and then they rip the plastic bags open and put the garbage, all, the rubbish all over the, the driveway. I gotta go out and clean that junk up. These things get rabies. The problems with rats, resistance to toxins and poisons. You notice there's more shark attacks. Australia, America, every year there's more. Bird flu fever. In Asia, they are terrified it will become a pandemic. But what happens when biogenetic engineering goes out of control? You make them, God says, they were made according to their mean, according to their kind. Now you artificially cross the genus barrier. What Darwinism couldn't do, man now can. Wouldn't take much. What about if you had, had, had gorillas or you had tigers with human, human intelligence or something approximating it? Don't think it's not possible. You've got rats with 1% human brain now. Can you imagine rats that could think like people? We are at the precipice of what would have been even 10, 12, 15 years ago unthinkable, but Jesus tells us the beasts of the earth are going to come against us. Now don't get me wrong, I'm in favor of protecting endangered species and all that. I always have been. But I also know what the Bible says by us destroying the natural habitats of these species, we are forcing them to mutate into animals that would one time shy away from people, now in their own quest for survival to become more vicious, hostile to humans. You're going to see problems with animals growing and growing and growing and growing because of what we've done to the habitat. Remember, the first seals are the consequence of man's own sin. It's the working of Satan. Yes, God allows it. God brings these things in judgment. But it's still, tribulation is Satan's time. And so we have the ashen horse. Fourth one. And this ashen horse or pale horse, Matthew 24, 7, pestilence, earthquake. Natural disasters. What happens when you have a natural disaster? What are they afraid of in New Orleans or after the tsunami? They're afraid of pestilence coming as a result of it. We don't think of it now because of quinoquinine, but people used to die from malaria in Louisiana and Florida, same as they die now in the third world. You have these natural disasters, you create these swamps in the middle of urban areas, you're going to have pestilence. And such is the fourth seal. Fifth seal. Let's read. When he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. 
And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood and those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who were to be killed even as they had been, should be completed also. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Remember what we looked at in Thessalonica? Those who persecute us are setting themselves up for judgment. Remember we, we looked at that in Thessalonica? Those who do these things to us are setting themselves up. They are auto-indicting themselves. And so we have this fifth seal. Turn with me please. To Matthew 24, 9. Jesus' interpretation. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. We don't have to suffer. No, we will not suffer the wrath of God. But true Christians, most places and most times, have suffered persecution from Satan. The only reason it hasn't happened in Britain and America in the last 500 years or whatever is because of the influence of the gospel. Now that we turned against the gospel, you know what's going to happen. Our freedom is a historical anomaly. This is what has caused the health and wealth heretics. This is what's caused the pre-trib stuff. They are reinterpreting the Bible out of its own context into the context of their own experience as free societies. Ignoring the fact that that freedom is a historical anomaly. Now understand how this happens. It will in some way replay what happened in the early church. In the early church, persecution tended to be local and sporadic initially. Local and sporadic. The Domitian persecution put John here. Once you get to the end of the first century, what Nero did mainly in Rome and Italy becomes global or became something that was throughout the Roman Empire, the known world. Christians are persecuted in Iran, Christians are persecuted in China, Christians are persecuted in Saudi Arabia. And so Jesus says, when they persecute you in one place, flee to another. We have to understand this. There are two things the Bible tells us to do that most people don't think about as much as they should because they haven't had to. One is appealing to Caesar. But a time will come when you can no longer appeal to Caesar because Caesar is the persecutor. The other is, when they persecute you in this place, flee to the next. There were a lot of Jews killed in the Holocaust because they wouldn't get out of Germany when they were told to get out. They lost their assets because when they were told to transfer them to Switzerland and America and England, they didn't. Had they gotten out, they would have saved their necks. People become so addicted to the materialistic lifestyle that they will not be flexible enough. Remember what Jesus said? Let he who's in the house not go back for his goods. But he says something else. Let he who's in the field not go back for his cloak, the mantle of authority. Let's look at what's happening now. They don't even understand what's happening now. They don't have a clue. Let us look at the death of the megachurch. If a lot of people, by God's grace, get saved or are discipled and a church gets huge, praise the Lord. If it becomes a vehicle to finance missions and evangelism because of its size and evangelism, praise the Lord. But when the aim becomes having a big church, instead of seeing people 
saved and discipled, now you got a problem. Somebody is empire building. They're building their empire instead of the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus warned about, that he who was in the field not go back for his cloak. The work of the Lord becomes an idol. The work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. They want to be a big wheel for the sake of being a big wheel, not for the greater aim of the gospel. So when Stephen is martyred, God allows it to happen. Previously, God got Peter out of prison. God intervened, but he let Stephen get martyred. And now, the mega church has ended. Was it Satan's fault? Yes. Was it Paul's fault? Yeah, Paul was one of the guys who killed him. But ultimately, it was God who allowed it to happen for his reasons. All things work together for the better. The mega churches you see now came about as a result of the last revival we had in the Western world, the Jesus movement with the hippies. It was my generation. Woodstock, we can get a million people, we can get two million people, two million hippies, and we can get two million people in one place, we can get Nixon out of the White House, we can get Johnson out of the White House, we can end the war, we can change society, we can do this. Strength in numbers. That was the thinking of the hippies, and so the hippies get saved, and now you got Calvary chapels, and now you got the, you know, the mega churches and all this stuff. These things came from the hippies. But now you find out it doesn't work. We can change society. Well, we'll all vote Republican. That'll Christianize America. So you get a Ronald Reagan Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor. A Reagan conservative appointed by Reagan, pro-abortion, writes the decision to take the Ten Commandments out of the Judicial Building in Alabama. No, it doesn't work. Lip service at election time. They're not changing the world. Their mega churches are not changing the world. In fact, they're not even seeing people getting disabled and discipled anymore. They're running on gimmicks, fads, programs, purpose-driven, and the rest of it. When persecution comes, these things the days are numbered. God will allow an end to be put to it. Yes, it'll be Satan and all, but God will allow it for his purpose. These mega churches are never ever going to do it. They will never ever ever prepare the church for the last days. They have had their day. Now they are no longer running in the power of God's spirit. They are running in the power of marketing and psychology and increasingly even new age. Remember the first mega church? What put an end to it? You're going to see an end to the mega church. First of all, Satan has raised up the money preachers not only to corrupt the gospel and discredit it, but they will provoke laws that will be used against legitimate ministries. You will lose your tax exemption for your building. Or what? You won't give somebody a position as a minister because they're a homosexual? That's discrimination. You're no longer a tax-exempt organization. That's already happening in Canada. And it will come global. Persecution is coming.